what Passive House does is it takes an envelope first approach. And by envelope, we're referring to the wall assemblies, the roof, the floors, the windows, all of the aspects around Passive House surround the idea of comfort. So comfort is defined more than just thermal temperature. Comfort is all five senses. So things like no drafts in the winter. We also want all of the surfaces in the house to be within about six degrees of each other. So by ensuring a continuous thermal insulation layer, we also want to eliminate thermal bridges. Removing thermal bridges is also really important from a mold and condensation point of view. Welcome to Mindful Businesses, our sustainable home. And I am your host, Vidya Ayer. In our podcast, we bring to you brands that are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business adopts and employs sustainable social, economic, and environmental practices. In this series, Our Sustainable Home, we talk about resources, options, and innovations in building a sustainable home. Mindful Businesses has been airing episodes since July of 2019 and have met several innovators, creators, and thought leaders. But we realized that the process and the path to build a sustainable home was at best confusing and ever evolving. Today, we talk with Matt Bowers of Rochester Passive Home Consulting. He's a certified Passive House Consultant by New York State Energy Research Development Authority. He joins us from Rochester, New York. Thank you, Matt, for coming on our show. Thank you very much, Vidya. I look forward to speaking with you further today about Passive House Construction. As our listeners may know, we moved to Western New York and we decided that we would make our next home as sustainable as possible. We started looking into what is a sustainable home and we learned several relevant concepts such as Net Zero, Energy Star, LEED Certified Homes, Passive House Certification. As a homeowner who was trying to implement the most accessible way to make our home quote-unquote eco-friendly, we were not sure what would be the first thing that we should look into. So Passive House is a construction style that was developed in Germany back in the early 1990s. And what they have done is taken the super insulated house that was constructed in the early 70s in the U.S. and improved it. What Passive House does is it takes an envelope first approach. And by envelope, we're referring to the wall assemblies, the roof, the floors, the windows, all of the components that surround you from the elements outside. And when we focus on an envelope first approach, we reduce the size and and the need for mechanical systems, such as your heating and cooling system and other systems. I have seen this concept explained very simply. Say you boil a pot of water and you leave it outside, even with a covered lid, it loses heat rapidly. Whereas if you pour that hot water in a thermos, it retains the heat for a very long time. That is an excellent analogy. Yes, we are trying to build a thermos. We want to keep all of the heat in. And we want to keep all the cold out. And we do that using an envelope first approach. So when we talk about passive house, we are only talking about energy. Energy is only a part of what passive house is. Primarily, passive house is a comfort standard. All of the aspects around passive house surround the idea of comfort. So comfort is defined more than just thermal temperature, right? That might be what you consider comfortable when you talk about being in your house is I just want to be warm in the winter. But comfort is all five senses. Right. So things like no drafts in the winter, 
So air leakage, so we want the house to be really, really tight. When we talk about air leakage, we don't want our air that we've paid a lot of money for to condition to just be leaking out cracks in the house. So we also want all of the surfaces in the house to be within about six degrees of each other. And when we do that, we prevent natural convection currents from happening. So when you say six degrees of each other, like say I touch my table versus an exterior wall, the difference in the temperature should be no more than six degrees Fahrenheit. Exactly. Why so? So the reason for that is your body receives radiant energy from the sun. If you've ever been outside on maybe a 40 degree Fahrenheit day, but it's sunny outside, you might not feel that you need a coat because there's that large ball of gas in the sky that's keeping you warm with its radiant energy. Okay, so when you are in a passive house and all of the surfaces are within six degrees of each other, you don't feel that pull of coldness from maybe the middle of a large window if the pane of glass is really cold. So that's kind of where you start to feel some more natural convection currents occurring in the house if different surfaces are different temperatures. So we want the inside face of your window to be within six degrees of an interior wall to be within six degrees of your basement floor. You achieved this basically by enveloping the roof, the windows, the walls, and the basement? So we want to make sure that the, the entire house or building, passive house isn't just single family houses, it's all buildings, all usage types, has a continuous insulation layer. And by continuous insulation layer, we mean from the part of the, the house that is touching the earth all the way around to what is up in the attic or in the roof space. Uh, we want a continuous, really thick insulation layer going all the way around the house. Is that one of the concepts of thermal bridges? So thermal bridges is another really important concept within Passive House. So if you've got a really thick wall and you've got a really thick insulated slab we want to make sure that the connection between the two isn't leading to a thermal bridge. So a thermal bridge is just a highway where temperature from inside of your house can have a direct highway out of the house. So by ensuring a continuous thermal insulation layer, we also want to eliminate thermal bridges. Removing thermal bridges is also really important from a mold and condensation point of view. Wherever you have a thermal bridge, you have a potential for a really, really cold surface on the inside of your house that can lead to mold growth, mildew growth. And that is obviously something we want to try to avoid in all of our houses. If you talk about passive house on very basic first base principles, we're talking all about heat transfers, right? How heat moves from one surface to another Either it becomes cooler or it becomes hotter. Or So imagine your whole house or home, or townhouse or commercial space is a structure where heat is moving from one space to another and you're trying to make that equitable and without any loss. Does that make sense? Yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We want to make sure that the entire outside perimeter of the house or the outside surface area of the house is completely isolated from the outside temperatures. You talked a lot about ceiling and one of the fears most people have in a tightly enveloped home is condensation and mold. How do you prevent that? As I explained, most builders want a home that breathes. How do passive homes breathe? So passive homes breathe with a very small mechanical ventilation system. The original idea for passive house came about and it was defined as a home that only needs the air that's required to maintain optimal indoor air quality to be able to heat the house. So most single family homes require about one or two bath fans worth of ventilation air 
roughly 120 cubic feet per minute of fresh air to be delivered to the house. So what Passive House is saying is we want that 120 CFM cubic feet per minute of air can only hold so much heat. So we want to reverse engineer the envelope so that is the case. When we talk about we don't want to build a house airtight because it needs to breathe, that's actually a really big false. We want houses as tight as possible. And we want houses tight as possible for building durability because with air leaks come moisture. Hot, humid air is going to get into your wall assemblies and that's where it can start to condense and create mold and mildew growing within your walls. So we want to make sure that the house is as tight as possible. And then we're going to provide the occupants the fresh air directly to where they're going to be breathing it. How do you define fresh air? Is it with the high oxygen content and low carbon dioxide? How do you measure it? We're just calling it outdoor air, okay? And do need to be mindful, obviously, of what that outdoor air quality is. But for most houses, bringing in outdoor air and then filtering it with a filter to get the pollen out of the air and the, the dust and all of that other stuff that is actually contaminating the outdoor air, we're going to filter that. And then we're going to bring that fresh air in and it's going to be delivered to the bedrooms and to the living spaces. Now, at the same time, that fresh air, the stale air that's within the house is going to be taken out and blown outside. And so usually we're taking the air out of your bathrooms and your kitchen area and removing it from the house. And this is going to result in a full air change throughout the house over the course of about three hours. So as we come out of the pandemic, people may recall that in the early days of the pandemic, we talked about the fresh air circulation, which is so important in helping reduce the spread of the virus. So a passive house would naturally do that, need to have these special blowers or fans put in. Yeah, so most buildings were closed down during the pandemic because they didn't have adequate ventilation. All passive houses come with ventilation to make sure that you have a minimum air change of one full air change of air every three hours. And like I said, that's a minimum. It's going to depend more on how many occupants you have, what kind of cooking you do, all of those other potential contaminants. But from an overall perspective, a minimum of one air change every three hours. We had Eric Corey Fried of Canon Design in one of our earlier episodes, and he said the lunch coma is actually air quality, that carbon dioxide levels in office buildings or schools get so high midday that post-lunch, it makes people drowsy. There is absolute truth to that. Passive house schools are starting to become more and more popular because the larger buildings are actually more economically feasible to do passive house construction with. And there are a lot of other benefits, like you say, carbon dioxide levels within the classrooms to keep students awake so their alertness is better and their grades are better. So there are a lot of other aspects to that. But I also should say that doesn't mean that we can't open windows either. Operable windows is really an important tool to be able to help cool your house in the summer so that we don't have the need for as much mechanical cooling. So let's go to the nuts and bolts of a passive house. In this series, we'll talk specifically about a residential home. Is it possible to retrofit an older home and make it a passive house? Absolutely, you can retrofit a, a, an existing house to the passive house levels. Just because you're building new or just because you're retrofitting a house doesn't really exclude one standard from the other. With a retrofit, you are sometimes given a different set of challenges. Some of those challenges are orientation. So we can't necessarily take advantage of the solar gains that we would like to if we could turn the house. 
There are some other restrictions, such as historical registry houses, where we have to do interior insulation versus exterior insulation. And then there are the buildings and houses that we would prefer to do in stages. So maybe your windows are broken and it's time that you need to replace your windows. So having a plan to upgrade your house as different components or different areas of your house need upgrading. If you have a plan in place that every single time one of those things comes up, you upgrade it to a passive house level, by the end of five or six years, you all of a sudden have a passive house by doing it in stages. And is it something that can be done by the homeowners themselves with basic research, or do they need a consultant or and contractors who are knowledgeable about how to make the house passive? At the very minimum, you would need a consultant. And the reason a passive house consultant is important is they're able to give you targeted R values and basis of design performance values for your windows in order to achieve the level of performance that you're expecting, whether or not that's passive house or not. But they can also do the carbon calculations for you to help you identify whether or not your project will be carbon neutral or how long it will take to be carbon neutral and do all of those calculations for you as well. So we've thrown a couple of new terminologies, carbon neutral, net zero. What is the difference? Passive house, carbon neutral, and net zero are really three different entities, that, but they all can play really nice together if we let them. So passive house is going to take the envelope first approach. You can take that envelope first approach with a extremely high carbon footprint material like concrete and foams, or you can take that path with things like straw bale construction or using cellulose insulation, which is just recycled newspaper. Both are going to give you the same performance levels. They definitely have different carbon footprint impacts. True. That is how passive house and carbon neutral can kind of play really nice together. And then we take a look at what net zero is. It's going to depend on who you ask, but most people are going to define net zero as we make as much energy as the property uses over the course of a year. So the challenge usually with net zero is what do we do on the shoulder seasons when we are not making nearly as much energy as we're consuming? It's great that it's a wash at the end. However, in those shoulder seasons, we are still relying on the grid. So what we want to do is minimize the demand of the house so that our need for the use of the grid is minimized. And at some point when our grid becomes 100% renewable, we're going to be able to have more houses for occupants to be living in with a smaller amount of community solar or wind power or nuclear or any of the other uh, renewable technologies that are out there. So the way to approach to building a sustainable house is first envelop the house in such a way that there are no leakages, then to pick resources that provide you the comfort level and reduce the dependence on any energy regardless. So for instance, when we spoke before this call, you said, Vidya, a passive house will need less solar panels, which again is a resource which requires being made, being disposed of. It will reduce the number of solar panels that we would need for our home as against a well-built, well-insulated home. Exactly. Requiring less solar panels is important for a couple reasons. Number one, solar panels, believe it or not, are very, very carbon intensive. It really is going to make a carbon neutral design more challenging with the more solar panels you have. The second is you live in Western New York, the solar panels will probably at some point get covered with snow 
So how durable is the house in the event that you can't get out to clean them off? And by durable, I don't mean just being able to keep you dry. I mean, if the power goes out for an extended period of time, how comfortable are you really gonna be? There are a lot of people out there living in older homes. If the power goes out for more than an hour, they have to get into their car and go somewhere because their house gets too cold for them to live in. In a passive house, you will probably not notice it with the exception that your internet won't be working. How long will I not notice it? That depends on the design and how sunny it is. On sunny days, you will probably not need any heat at all. How many days will I not need heat? <laughs> so I live in a certified passive house and we have gone stretches of two or three weeks in the winter with our heat off. If we get a stretch of days where it's sunny outside. So what temperature do you set your home at? What is your comfort level in terms of the warmth in the house? We keep our house at between 72 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And if, for instance, we have a party, we probably will end up opening some windows. There have been mornings, Christmas morning, right? The grandparents come over, the kids are ripping through the presents, and it's kind of warm in the house. So we're going to open up some windows. That has happened on, on more than one occasion. And the joke has actually become whenever we have a party, it's quite literally a housewarming party. That's fascinating that you can go for a couple of weeks on sunny days without turning on the heat in Western New York. And you also mentioned, Vidya, if the house is built right and we design it in a way by using passive solar energy, by directing the windows and the house to optimize solarization, you mentioned that I would need energy as much as two blow dryers. Is that correct? That is correct. The average single family passive house, I've worked on over two dozen of them in the Western New York area, need roughly one hair dryer per floor to heat the house. That's very, very little. So how much in terms of like numbers, what consumption are we talking about? We heat our house for about $200 per year. So in terms of energy consumption, how many kilowatt hours would you consume? We can heat our house over the course of the winter for roughly 1,800 kilowatt hours. And a non-passive house would require? Maybe 10 times that. So what are the challenges? Why are more people not choosing to either make their existing homes passive or going forward just building passive homes? The return on investment seems so obvious. There are a couple challenges that we are faced with. Why are not all houses passive houses? It's too good to be true. Number one is builder training. We don't have a lot of builders who have experience in building passive houses or high performance houses. And there are some nuances that we want to make sure that get employed into a new construction or even a retrofit project that most builders don't have any interest in learning or don't have the time to learn, whatever the case may be. So number one is going to be builder training. Reason or the second real hurdle to why not all houses are passive houses is going to be designer training. There are not a lot of designers out there. When there are not a lot of designers, there are, is very little push when a client approaches an architect for, I'd like to build a an energy efficient home and the architect hasn't been trained in passive house and they are just going to more or less give you what the code minimums are. You're talking about codes, but most architects are trained in use of directional light, in air flows, in insulation, in positioning of rooms, windows, ventilation. So did they just forget that because of what is demanded of them when they start practicing? What you're saying is not so novel that it was not taught to them in school, right? That may not be the case. Architecture schools are still not teaching passive house techniques or trying. But passive house techniques are based on some principles, which are usually part of the training for an architect. Maybe, maybe not. Not necessarily. A lot of these principles are engineering principles, and they may or may not be taught in architecture school. 
So are you an architect or a civil engineer or a self-taught person? I spent six years in the U.S. Navy as a nuclear engineer, and I got really interested in fluid mechanics and thermodynamics from there. Once I was finished with my tour, I got out of the Navy and went to engineering school with a focus on heating and cooling system design. And that's where I learned about buildings so energy efficient, they didn't need furnaces anymore. What am I going to be designing furnaces for if we don't need them anymore? And so that's where my path to passive house techniques kind of came from. And the place that I learned about these buildings that are so energy efficient, they didn't need furnaces was not from my thermodynamics class. It was not from my fluid mechanics class. It was not from any of my engineering classes. It was just a general elective that I learned about this. And which was? The elective was? The elective was energy and the environment. And how long ago was that? I graduated in 2008 from the Rochester Institute of Technology. So it's been around a while. Yes, Passive House has been around a while. It's getting to the point now where more and more people are understanding it because there is verbiage in building codes and there is verbiage in incentive programs and there is verbiage in a wide variety of conference topics and things like that. So the word is getting out on it, but we're still at the point where for it to really take off, we need demand. And if clients and homeowners and people who are building homes or looking to move into homes, if they start asking for it, that's where Passive House is really going to just take off. Like everything, the consumers have to demand it. There's always this question, should we just have legislation or should we companies themselves get up one day and say, we're going to do this? But I think the major thrust comes for many of the sustainable products from consumers. That's how I feel. There are a lot of people who are pushing the policy. We need public policy, and certainly public policy can help drive some of that consumer awareness. From where I view things, if people are asking for it, they're going to hold contractors more accountable. Whereas if contractors and architects are doing it to meet code, I've done enough code compliance testing to know that they're going to try to get away with as much as they can to just barely meet the code. So we want people who are doing it for the right reasons, not doing it because they have to, because that's kind of where failures occur. We don't want any failures because that's the last thing that the passive house movement needs is a bunch of fake passive houses that aren't working and people are unhappy. So there are some standards that Passive House has. Does it vary by whether it's residential, whether it's commercial, whether it is made in Europe or in America or Asia? The Passive House certification criteria is going to be the same regardless of where in the world you are. And that is going to impact your heating demand. So heating demand is the amount of energy that the building is going to consume over the heating season. There's a cooling demand criteria limit. And so that obviously is the total amount of energy that you consume over the winter. There's an air tightness requirement. And the air tightness requirement is only there to ensure building durability. It certainly helps with the energy side of things, but it's mainly there for building durability. And the other aspect is going to be total energy use. It's actually source energy use. And by source energy use, we are going to account for losses of the grid as well, or the distribution system of the energy source. So how much do Energy Star appliances play into the whole energy consumption? Because we are talking about heat loss or heat gain and how do we balance it? So how much role do Energy Star appliances play in making the house passive? A majority of the challenges with a single family house stem around the heating system uh, demand. Energy Star appliances or high performance electrical appliances do play an important role, but not necessarily for energy use, but for internal gain purposes in overheating the house in the summer. Your refrigerator 
a byproduct of refrigeration inside the refrigerator is heat. So if you have a really inefficient refrigerator, it's going to give off a lot of heat. And most passive houses have enough buffer for a single family house that an inefficient refrigerator isn't going to prevent you from getting certified. But it could really play into this area of the kitchen is just really, really warm in the summer. It Again, it plays into the comfort side of things. And the other real important aspect of appliances is actually noise because within a passive house everything is super super quiet and the loudest appliance in my house is my refrigerator so the more efficient the appliance generally speaking the quieter it's going to operate are these standards measured continuously because it changes with season right weather patterns with it's a sunny day is there a constant measurement process The way that Passive House certification works is it is a certification of the energy model. Now, the energy model needs to be verified in extreme detail by a Passive House certifier. Now, the certifier is going to look at the plans. They're going to look at the energy model. They're going to look at all of the photo documentation of the construction of the house, and they're going to verify that it meets the Passive House criteria. As you alluded to, every winter is different. Every summer is different. How does that work? How does, you know, can it be a passive house one year and not a passive house the next year because the winter was really cold? The answer is no. But the weather data set that we use in our passive house energy model is an average over the course of 10 to 15 year averages. And many times, if we are in an area that doesn't necessarily have a really good weather data set, we will combine data sets and do some interpolation to make sure that the weather data set is approved by the Passive House Institute. And I only bring that up because there are a lot of locations in the country that still really don't have good weather data. You could go up to the Adirondacks and have a completely different weather set than three miles down the road where the weather station is because of difference in elevation and difference in, you know, where the mountains are and things like that. The Passive House Institute does not recommend particular products. It just recommends the engineering part of it. Exactly. Passive House is not going to tell you how to build a building. They are just going to tell you what the end product needs to be. And it's up to the client, the architect, the designer, and the builder to work as a team to figure out the best way to meet that criteria based on the client's overall goals. Some clients are going to be fine with using a lot of concrete and foam insulation that is really, really carbon intensive. And some clients are going to want to say, I want a straw bale house because I can harvest the straw from my land and be really, really carbon and make the house extremely carbon negative. How much premium is it to build a passive house in terms of percents? That is a really good question. I always have to defer to it depends. I will give you a percentage in just a minute, but let's talk through a few different situations. In my experience, your finishes are going to have a larger impact on the overall cost of the house than whether or not the house is passive house. So when you talk about finishes, really ornate trim work with really expensive floors with really expensive huge countertop kitchens and really ornate bathrooms with lots of tile those kinds of decisions and exotic hardwood floors throughout those decisions are going to have a larger impact than the cost of whether or not the building is passive house or not with that said there are also a lot of costs that are associated with a house that do not impact your square footage. Things like how close is the house to the road because you could need a 20 foot driveway or you could need a 500 foot driveway. It just depends on the lot. That is going to add a substantial amount of cost with no impact on square footage. Your square footage is your square footage. Okay, so distance from the road plays a really big impact on overall cost. The size of a garage The garage is not included in your square footage, but it's a whole nother structure that you're including in the house. 
with the overall cost of the house. So the size of the garage and, and all of those aspects, there's actually a, a pretty substantial price difference between building a ranch style house, a one story house and a two story house. If, for example, we've got a 2,000 square foot house, well, if it's a ranch, that means you've got a 2,000 square foot roof and you've got a 2,000 square foot basement or a foundation that you have to put in. But if that same 2,000 square foot house has two stories, well, now the size of the basement is half, the size of the roof is half. There really are a lot of differences in style of house and things like that. And then there are the other aspects of the house, things like porches and your decks and the landscaping that, again, are going to add cost to the house that don't impact square footage at all. With that said, what I'm typically seeing is roughly a 5 to 15% premium as an increased cost to go to passive house. And that is a, an extreme generalization. Say we make this choice of building this one home, which we go with the conventional building methods. You have your fiberglass insulation with the regular concrete basements with your heating and cooling, which we've had in all our past homes. And the new one, which we hope that we will work with the energy consultant who will help us build a passive house, you're saying the difference would be 15%. And that is in the capital cost, the upfront cost. Correct. That is an increased upfront cost. How long do you think it would take me to break even? That is going to depend on electrical rates and, and a lot of other things. But generally speaking, it will pay for itself before the mortgage is up. Typically, what we like to do is a calculation called cost of a saved BTU. We're going to look at it a little bit differently you know, why does the payback of insulation that's going to last for 50 to 100 years have to pay back in seven? That doesn't necessarily make sense. So what we do is a calculation called cost of a saved BTU. And so we take the initial cost, say a BTU costs two cents or so right now. If we can find a solution that is going to cost the homeowner maybe one and a half cents or one cent to save that BTU, then that method is worthwhile and it should be implemented. Products have residual value. You buy a new car off of the lot for $20,000. I don't know if you can buy a new car for $20,000, but in five or six years, you can trade it in for maybe it's $500. It's not a lot, but it has some value left. So what we want to make sure that we're doing is we're accounting for some of that residual value within the different components of the house. And what I will say is things that have high residual value are usually really beneficial to do because they typically don't move. They're not operable parts. They're not mechanical systems. Those things have a lifespan that, and need to get replaced every 10 to 15 years, whereas insulation is going to be there for the life of the home. So insulation and air sealing and things like that are usually well, well worth the investment. One of the biggest chunks of investments besides insulation would be the energy source. Like do you put geothermal? Do you put solar panels? And when we looked into the return on investment of just solar panels, in our Indiana home, we figured it would take over 15 years because the state has very few incentives to help the homeowners install solar panels. Whereas when we moved to Western New York, New York has progressive and aggressive energy strategies. And we calculated our return on investment would be in five years. This is the same size house, two different states, and we can see that it is easier for us to build sustainable home in Western New York as against state, which does not provide these incentives for homeowners and builders. Incentives certainly play in a large role when it comes to payback, but we do need to be mindful that there is more to the overall building of a house than what's the payback. 
right? We're talking about thermal comfort. We're talking about indoor air quality. We're talking about all of the other things that we've just spent this conversation speaking about. There are a lot of hidden benefits to doing a sustainable house compared to a general code-built house. But the incentives do nudge people who are fence-sitters to make that leap of faith. And New York has some incentives. Would you like to share some of them? For instance, when you hire an energy consultant, the state pays for some of their fees. Yes. NYSERDA, who's the authority here in New York that does run a lot of the incentive programs, offers some incentive money for design assistance, up to $10,000 in design assistance, help clients get to the passive house levels with their current designs. And they also offer some training assistance for builders on site. And they also have a very good, just general incentive for achieving a certified passive house. The incentive is going to vary based on square footage and number of occupants and a number of other things, but it's generally in the $2,500 per house range. Say I was going out and purchasing a certified passive home. How do I know it's truly a certified passive home? That is another wonderful question. I'm glad you asked that. So there is a difference between a certified passive house and a passive house inspired house. A certified passive house goes through a lot of quality assurance to make sure that all of the assumptions within the house are correct, all of the dimensions are correct. The energy model, for example, has about 15,000 inputs, and chances are you miss a decimal point here or there, right? It's just human nature to make some minor mistakes like that. The certification process is going to go over each one of those inputs to make sure that it's correct. And then they're going to make sure that not only was the input in the energy model correct, but that there's photo evidence showing that that input is correct. And so that is really the complete individual third party verification of the house is way more intensive than someone saying, I've done five of these. So we don't need to go through this process anymore. I don't know about you, but if I have the option to take an exam or to not take an exam, I'm not going to take the exam. But if I'm going to take the exam, I'm going to study for it. So if the builder and the architect and the whole team knows that they're going for certification, they have to make sure that they're going to achieve certification. Whereas if they're just going to try to do pretty good, we don't know what that is going to end up. So the certified passive house is really, really a quality assurance staple for passive house. And how do you know if your house is a passive house or not? There's a database for certified passive houses right on the internet on Passive House Institute's website. And there should be a pretty cool looking plaque right on the front of the house that says this is a certified passive house. It's not a little sticker that's hidden away on the inside of your electrical panel. It's a plaque that goes right next to the front door for everyone to see it. On that uplifting note, thank you so much, Matt Bowers of Rochester Passive House for coming on our show. Thank you again for taking the time to come on Mindful Businesses, our sustainable home. You are so welcome, Vidya. It's been a pleasure. We'd love to hear from you. Send a voice note or an email with your questions or comments to info at mindfulbusinessespodcast.com. Subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts. If you learned a thing or two from this episode, share it with one friend. We recorded this podcast in Buffalo, New York. Theme music was composed by Tatum Gale. Our marketing assistant is Roseanne Korean. Our advisors are Jim Stone and Anupama Pashricha. This is Vedya Iyer with Mindful Businesses, Our Sustainable Home.